So we'll go ahead and get started. We got a good amount of ground to cover today, um, and uh, and I think you all will enjoy what what we get to talk about. Um, and uh, I think I think you'll appreciate kind of some of the stuff that we're going to cover because we go from kind of big national level environmental issues, of course, then jumping into some of what's going on locally. Um, Want to kind of delve in, you know, dive in um, and really talk about what's going on with this administration compared to the last administration, obviously a little bit of night and day in terms of politics and philosophy. Um, as you all know, the last administration called for a mentality and kind of an ethic focused around what they called energy dominance. Um, and the idea behind energy dominance, of course, was to deregulate, um, and that looked like everything from deregulating the national monuments and reducing those, for example, in Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante, to developing um, as much of the public lands as possible for fossil fuels. Um, and obviously this administration under President Biden has taken a very different approach. Um, I would say a much more deliberative approach, uh, calling for a pause to slow things down and, you know, with this sense that things got a little bit out of hand, obviously under the previous administration. And so what do I mean by that? Um, un under President Trump, uh, 7.2 million acres of land and water were leased to private companies for extraction of fossil fuels. That's an area about the size of Maryland in just those four years were leased um, for extraction of fossil fuels. Right now then about one fifth of greenhouse gases are now coming off of US public lands. So if you think of that, you all are public land owners, um, you all are public land caretakers and stewards. One fifth of all greenhouse gases in the United States are now coming off of public lands. Um, the Wilderness Society did a study that said that the Trump leases could result in a life cycle emission between 1 .1 billion to 5.9 billion metric tons of CO2 just from those leases that were done under his administration. That's more than half of the annual emissions of China, by far the world's largest emitter of CO2 and more than the entire European Union. So if you think about what was leased and what's been done in that amount of time, you're you know, basically uh, engulfing the entire European Union's uh, carbon production. Um, in 2018, public lands and waters produced 39% of US coal, 21% of US oil, and 14% of US gas. Um, basically what all this shows is, is that uh, oil and gas companies have had an oversized influence on America's public lands that of course belong to you and me. Um, and the other thing that it shows is that the leasing system is broken and in need of serious reforms to bring it into the 21st century. Um, and so you, you all have probably heard about the leasing pause and kind of why that's what that is, but I don't think there's been a lot of really good explanation for what that's about. And a lot of it is about assessing these reforms and giving Congress and the administration time to figure out how do we get things back into balance, um, recognizing that our public lands protect wildlife, clean water, clean air, access to outdoor recreation, and how do we leave these areas really in the stewardship of all of us in a better place. So I wanna kind of now pivot to look at the specific reforms that need to be made um, around some of these major issues coming up. So one of you, uh, many of you may know that Senator Lujan released a bill, um, the short name of it is, is the regrow bill um, but you can see the full title of it. And he really, it's a bipartisan bill with Senator Lujan and Senator Kramer out of North Dakota. Um, what's the issue? Well, basically there's over 56,000 documented orphaned oil and gas wells. These are abandoned wells with no responsible party for cleanup. Basically they're leaking methane, which as you all know, is far more, um, 84 times more potent than CO2. Uh, they're contaminating groundwater. They're creating risk for communities with cancer causing agents as part of this, these leaks. Um, but they also are a risk for wildlife and then, of course, livestock and agriculture. Um, the EPA actually says that the real estimated number of abandoned wells throughout the United States is probably somewhere upwards of 2 million. Um, the problem is, is finding these wells and tracking them down. And they know of 56,000, but they think there's probably somewhere around 2 million across the country. Over the past year, as you can see, um, abandoned and orphaned wells have become a major problem. You had 40 uh, oil and gas producers declaring bankruptcy just in 2019, walking away from these areas that they previously dwell, uh, drilled. And this isn't just a, a problem, you know, in Farmington or say the Permian Basin or other parts of the West. I mean, it's amazing when you start to look into this issue to see how pervasive it is across the country. For example, Beverly Hills School District spent $22 million to clean up 19 orphaned and abandoned wells at a high school. 
the Navajo Nation um, had around 48, nearly 50 abandoned wells that they have found on the Navajo Nation that are containing dangerous levels of arsenic, sulfate, benzate, formaldehyde, chloride, and other cancer causing agents. Um, and of course, these agents are impacting the drinking water. And so then they had to cease community drinking water on the Navajo Nation. Um, also impacting livestock and agriculture, um, which if you think about it, if you're going out to hunt deer or elk and these animals are drinking from these areas where there's contaminated water leaking, that's obviously not you know, a good thing to be eating that game meat or, that, or those livestock. Um, places like Pennsylvania, Indiana, I mean, just ridden with abandoned wells, if you think about where a lot of the early drilling in this country occurred. In Pennsylvania, they're saying that there could be over 200,000 abandoned wells in just that state alone. And it's crazy. People are finding them on their property that they didn't know there were there. They'll kind of start smelling something coming up from the ground or start seeing water leaking out of the ground with some kind of you know, bad smell to it. And they'll realize that they had purchased you know, property with right where their house is, where there's a couple of abandoned wells. Um, so it's happening all over the eastern part of the United States, also parks, places like Beverly Hills, but also, of course, places like New Mexico and a lot of our tribal lands. Um, you know, the bigger other issue that you see is that these wells are leaking methane, which is a, a major problem for cl climate change and, and greenhouse gases, which is 84 times more potent than CO2. Of course, our, our friends at Cabo have done a lot of work around kind of methane regulations and requirements, um, you know, in, in, in the state of New Mexico in terms of like the point source, but, but abandoned wells are also a major, major issue and source for these, for methane release. So what does this bill from Senator Lujan do? Um, it basically creates uh, a fund, $4.6 billion, to plug wells and restore and reclaim these lands. Um, you can see that the majority of these lands are going to be on state and private lands, but also clean up on public and tribal lands. The other thing that it does is it creates $32 million for research, development, and implementation. Of course, you've got to be able to document where these are. And so there's a lot of ways that they can do that. Everything from looking at, um, you know, kind of infrared and where these gases are leaking from. For, to literally people are walking through the forest of Pennsylvania and finding areas that are bubbling up from the ground. Um, and so they're trying to track down where all these wells are and then find a way to plug them and make sure that they're not, you know, impacting the, the, the environment um, as much as they should be. The whole issue, of course, is creating more jobs in this economy, as you saw from the previous slide. Um, the oil and gas industry has lost about 100,000 jobs since the start of COVID. How do you put people back to work, um, especially when the industry is as volatile as it is and supply and demand are doing what they're doing right now? Um, one of the ways is, of course, to do it on restoration and resilience and cleanup. And so that's the idea behind this is to also put a lot of people back to work and people who know what they're doing around these oil and gas rigs um, and wells that are already ha have that knowledge, but then can also be trained, of course, to plug them and to, to make them safer for the, the habitat around it. So that's Lujan's bill. Um, what's interesting is that, of course, New Mexico is leading the way on both these bills. Uh, Representative Teresa Ledger Fernandez also has a bill uh, in the House side that's very similar to Lujan's bill. One thing that you're going to notice is um, that this bill uh, from Ledger Fernandez has about double the money. Um, of course, the House is a little uh, more progressive and a little easier to pass that kind of money through compared to the Senate. Um, and so if you kind of look down those numbers, you're going to see that the money's double. But the other thing that's really significant about Representative Teresa Ledger Fernandez's bill is that it also requires bonding. Um, and so one of the things that's really important to understand is not only how do we fix the mess that's there, but how do we prevent it in the future? Um, a lot of people don't know this about oil and gas, um, but before companies are allowed to drill, um, oil and gas companies have to put down a bond that's like a security deposit that covers the cost of projected cleanup for the well sites. However, the problem is that when companies go bankrupt um, and they abandon these wells, the taxpayers are really left to clean up the contamination right now, which is in, of course, drinking water and the air and the wildlife habitat. The issue is that the bonding rates were set in the 1950s and 60s, and they haven't been updated by Congress. And so if you think about the you know, cost of inflation, plus just technology, plus the scale of what's going on, um, those rates are not going to nearly cover what's, what's going to be you know, necessary to clean up an abandoned or orphaned well um, here in, in these contexts. So the idea is that Congress needs to update these bonding requirements to ensure that the taxpayers and, of course, the broader public and wildlife don't suffer the consequences of the, of the companies who um, are, are abandoning these wells. What's really interesting is a lot of fiscal conservatives, of course, are even behind this kind of idea. 
because they see it as important as taking responsibility for the mess you've made. Um, and so hence why I think it's also, you know, opportunities for bipartisanship. I think you're going to see a Senate companion bill that covers bonding reform, probably from Senator Bennett out of Colorado. So Lujan Kramer bill doesn't have bonding in it. Um, the, the criticism of bonding is, well, that's going to cost oil and gas companies more money. And so we don't want to necessarily do that, or it's going to be a more challenging for the smaller oil and gas companies to meet that bond. Um, there's some there's some truth to that, but I think the challenges, of course, are you know the, the big issue is what happens when folks just abandon wells and then leave these bigger issues. So there's kind of a back and forth going on with that. But I suspect Senator Bennett, sometime in the year in the next future uh, or in the near future, will introduce a bill that's very similar to the Lujan Kramer bill, but that'll also include a bonding um, package with it. Um, does anyone have any questions on those those issues on the cleanup of abandoned wells or bonding issues? Trying to, trying to look at the screen. It's a little bit difficult with both the screen share, but it seems like everybody's got kind of this down. Um, so of course, the other thing is Senator Heinrich and Senator Lujan are both on that bill, on the Kramer bill. Um, and so both of our senators are on board with it, but there's opportunity, of course, if you know folks in other states to say, hey, you know, could you, you know, tell your senators to co-sponsor that bill, which is really, a, a, you know, I think everybody's for cleanup and it's it's pervasive across the country. And so it's, it's really a non-controversial bill in terms of that that uh, Lujan Kramer bill. And then of course, Trace Ledger Fernandez's bill in the house is also another one that you could ask folks to co-sponsor in terms of, let's see what happens with the seat in Albuquerque. And then of course, you know, I bet Harold down South, but you know, other opportunities for other house members across the country to co-sponsor a bill like that, to be a, be a leader on, on some of these issues. The idea is probably that these bills are not gonna, you know, what we find in Congress nowadays is that most bills don't pass by themselves. They're part of a larger package that then, you know, um, you know, gets rolled into, say, an infrastructure bill. And so these provisions and stuff like that will probably, you know, you know, see some time in committee, get looked at from that perspective. But almost everything right now, you know, and, and has been true for years now, gets rolled into a much larger package that, you know, is focused on infrastructure or stimulus or job creation. So that's probably what you're going to see, um, you know, these bills in terms of taking the legislative path of. And the hope would be that that is coming down the pipeline sometime probably in September um, is there's a hope that there can be the next infrastructure slash stimulus bill that creates jobs and provisions like this that would put a lot of people back to work um, would probably be part of that larger package. Um, so what's the what's another issue that's going on with why these leases are the way they are um, the, the next issue is really focusing on rental and royalty rates for oil and gas companies. Um, basically right now, oil and gas companies are getting a sweetheart deal to drill on America's public lands. You know, right now, public lands are being sold for as cheap as $1.50 an acre, which is, of course, less than a cup of coffee. Um, this giveaway, of course, has led to drilling activity to more than double in the last few, uh, past few decades. Um, and the point is that the public, of course, is not receiving its fair share. If you can see from the slide, this, this bill is also bipartisan. You've got Senator Rosen out of Nevada and Senator Grassley out of Iowa. They're sponsoring this bill. Um, and the idea is to make these rates consistent with offshore rates. So offshore rates, you know, if you think about what's going on in the Gulf, are already at that 18.75%, but inshore rates are at 12.5%. Um, and so, you know, obviously industry is doing just fine with the offshore drilling. Um, the, the, the hope is to then make the inshore more in line with that. And what they found in the studies of this from, you know, various levels of Congress, and some of the research arms of this is that they actually think this level of increase will impact production. And if it does, it'll be only small and negligible. Obviously, there's plenty of profits to be made. Um, the other thing that they found is that this will bring in an, in, an incredible amount of money into the, uh, the states and federal government. I mean, you're looking at potentially 20 to $38 million per year in states where these rates would be adjusted. If you think about a state like New Mexico, I mean, that's, that's a lot of money and potential money to be putting towards everything from first responders to schools. Um, and obviously, um, you know, these, these areas are already being drilled and, uh, you know, being looked at in terms of speculative oil and gas leasing. And so um, it's, it's important to make sure that these rates are adjusted um, so that they kind of meet what's currently going on in the market. The, the other thing you're going to see is that they're just going to increase some of the, the rental Rates, uh, you know, you're looking at $1.50 per acre for the first five years and $2 an acre, at, you know, right now. The new rate would be $3 an acre for the first five years and $5 an acre after that. I mean, it's 
it's doubling the price. But if you think about that for an oil and gas company, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty small. The other issue is that you're going to have an end to speculative leasing. And we're going to talk about that here on the next slide. But does, does anyone have any questions on the, the royalty rates? And if you want, just go ahead and speak up. And, and uh, it's kind of hard for me to see who's on the screen right now. All right. So the last bill um, that I want to talk about and kind of, you know, part of this package of reforms, so to speak, um, around oil and gas is a bill actually that comes from Senator Cortez Masto. And this is an interesting issue that I really had no idea about and have learned a lot about in the last couple months. Um, and it's this idea of low and no potential leasing. And this is kind of a really interesting um, issue slash shell game that's going on that, like I said, I don't think a lot of people of the public understand or know is out there. So low and no potential lands refer to public lands that have little or no potential for oil and gas development. Basically, the issue is that these lands or their um, deposits underneath these lands are either inaccessible or they actually have no real oil and gas actually underneath them. About 75% of all lands that are available in the West for leasing um, have low and no potential. Um, in the state of New Mexico, obviously, many of our lands are, you know, are either high potential or low and no potential. Um, and, and obviously, the high potential lands are obviously being leased up in, of course, the Four Corners area and then, of course, in the Permian Basin down south. Um, but why, why would you lease a land that has no potential for, you know, extracting any of the oil and gas beneath it? The, the issue is basically that industry uh, right now can tell the BLM, we want to lease these lands. And the BLM has very little protocols to consider development potential at this stage. And so when industry nominates a parcel to be leased, then BLM is going to say, okay, we'll lease it to the oil and gas. And they put very little scrutiny on that. The issue is basically the fact that industry will nominate these parcels way of balancing out their budget sheets and looking like they're taking a loss. So they'll you know, pick a bunch of low and no potential lands. They won't develop them. It'll help balance out some of their budget sheet for other lands that they are developing. And the big issue is, of course, it's tying up these lands for other uses. Of course, BLM lands, Bureau of Land Management, are public lands. And so those lands can be used for grazing, outdoor recreation, fishing, you know, opportunities for mountain biking, those kind of things, uh, renewable energy, uh, other areas for conservation and wildlife corridors. So the problem is, is that industry is locking up, you know, telling the BLM, well, we want to lease these lands. And then they're locking up these lands that have low and no potential, which then allows them, it doesn't allow them to be managed by the agency for other uses. And then also allows these companies to be able to, uh, you know, balance out their budget sheets. The biggest thing that we're seeing is that about 11 million acres across the United States were leased without competition. And again, these are being leased for $1.50 an acre. Um, and so 97% of those leases were never even developed. Um, and the problem is, of course, this is costing taxpayers other opportunities that could be using those lands for wildlife or for conservation or for renewable energy or other areas that could actually be bringing in revenue or creating more opportunity for quality of life. So this is an issue that, of course, Senator Cortez Masto in Nevada, um, there's a lot of lands there that are low and no potential, and she's seeing a big issue with um, industry locking up these lands from BLM and basically, um, you know, making them single use instead of multiple, multiple use, which is what public land should be uh, managed for. Does that make sense to folks? Kind of, kind of an interesting issue, and, and it's an issue that I think, you know, obviously the hope is the agency, um, if this piece of bill from Congress doesn't go through with, but I think Cortez Masto is fighting for it to go through and be part of that bigger package. The other opportunity is maybe the agency, the BLM, uh, tightens up its own internal regulations and prohibits such things. And I think you potentially could see both coming up here in the future. So last piece on the federal level that I want to talk about um, is, as I mentioned, there's going to be probably a bigger upcoming infrastructure bill. Um, it's going to include everything from bridges and roads and, you know, all kinds of things across the United States. Um, but one of the big things that, uh, you know, the National Wildlife Federation, a bunch of different environmental groups are pushing for is restoration and resilience. And that includes everything from capping those orphaned and abandoned wells, uh, cleaning up abandoned mines, as you all know, you know, the major issues that happen similar with abandoned wells happens with abandoned mines where they leak into rivers like the Animus and Durango. Um, and, you know, places like Red River um, with the Cuesta Mine. 
So the idea is to put, you know, an enormous amount of people back to work by cleaning up mines, cleaning up wells, recovering wildlife, removing invasive species, um, expanding outdoor recreation, which of course could be things like everything from creating new access points or trail restoration um, to forest restoration, which could be everything, you know, around forest fire issues and, and thinning and burning and kind of thinking about how to better manage for healthier forests with regard to climate change. To coastal resiliency, um, you're seeing a lot of movement around that, obviously, with areas like Louisiana being as hit with as many hurricanes. And of course, the you know, entire southeast coast uh, last year just seeing you know, an inordinate amount of major storms. Um, and then also, of course, watershed restoration. What does that look like in a place like New Mexico where you have all these ephemeral streams? And how do you do more forest management and watershed restoration to protect both water sources and water clarity, um, but also at the same time, how do you protect uh, wildlife? And then, of course, sagebrush and grasslands, which would, you know, of course, impact more, more of the central parts of the country. So that's the idea is that in the infrastructure bill, there's, there's all these proposals to potentially have all these different ideas to restore um, and, and create more resilient ecosystems. And, and, and kind of the, the numbers that have been put to it, it would take about $200 billion to do all of those different things that I listed right there. But it also put about 3.5 million Americans back to work who are currently unemployed. Um, and, and you'll see that kind of dovetails with uh, what the administration talks about with the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, so you're probably going to see some stuff around that, which is kind of, you know, very similar to, to obviously the, the core that was, you know, put into effect in the, you know, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, where a lot of folks were, were working to kind of, you know, restore trails and do all kinds of things, roads. Um, and so the idea is that that would be the more modern version around that, around Climate Conservation Corps, and it would do a lot of work like this as well. It's kind of be a, a ecological AmeriCorps, so to speak. Does anyone have any questions on all the this is all the federal level stuff, and then we'll jump to what's happening in our own backyard. All right, it's like most folks are taking notes and studying, and 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 I'm really grateful for you all to pay attention to this. A lot of folks, I think, you know, they delve into the world of oil and gas. It seems mysterious. It seems too complex. People in our state, obviously, our state is really codependent on the oil and gas industry, and it booms and busts, and we don't really always understand why. And then, you know, we don't understand where to make some of these pinpoint precision reforms around these issues. Um, but I think these bills on the federal level, particularly the Lujan Kramer bill in the Senate, obviously Ledger Fernandez bill in the House, and then of course the, the Grassley Rosen bill around royalty rates, and then and then obviously Cortez Masto's low and no potential bill. I think these are all really good bills. I think they're really all common sense bills, and the idea is. How does Congress have some of the time, of course, to use some of this leasing cost to enact some of these reforms? Because things have gotten to be so problematic, not just under the last administration, but really over the last hundred years in terms of these issues and need, need to be updated and need to kind of step into the 21st century. And so that's a lot of the hope around a lot of these bills. And then, of course, the bigger pieces of how do you make more resilient ecosystems in the face of climate um, being part of this infrastructure package. Uh, Andrew, uh, Bill Humphreys, are faith communities uh, weighing in on any of these issues nationally? Um, not, uh, you're not seeing as much, I mean, maybe interfaith power and light a little bit at the national level of some of this stuff. Um, we, you know, that's part of the reason I'm presenting to you all today is to, to say, Hey, you know, weigh in and, and thanks Senator Lujan for this. Thanks Senator Heinrich for co-sponsoring that bill. Um, you know, thank Teresa Ledger Fernandez for that. Um, but also ask other folks in other parts of the country to ask their members to support these bills. Um, you know, these are all really critical. Um, in my opinion, from a social justice perspective, as well as an ecological perspective. Um, and so the idea, of course, is that I think the faith community really needs to, if we really want to be um, good keepers and stewards of this earth, you know, we need, we got some work to do, um, you know, and our impacts on the earth have been significant. So we've, we've got to, we've got to recognize that. And we need to also make sure that we, you know, work with communities that are frontline communities that are most impacted by methane and some of these abandoned wells, but also we work with communities that have lost a lot of jobs and may be very much rooted in that oil and gas patch. And so there's opportunities here for how do you, you know, how do you help those jobs become redemptive and restorative um, around some of these issues and put people back to work in good paying jobs. And so, yeah, Bill, I think your point is on, uh, that the faith community really does need to be thinking critically, especially in places like New Mexico, as you all know, I mean, COVID has hit our state hard, the oil and gas challenges have hit our state hard. Um, and these opportunities are right here in our own backyard. And I, and I don't think it's coincidental that you're seeing Lujan and uh, Ledger Fernandez be the leaders on some of these bills because of what's going on in our state and the, and the understanding of how 
these issues impact community health, how they impact um, jobs, how they impact, of course, wildlife and livestock and agriculture. Um, you know, I think that's all tied together. And then the faith community, I think it, it, play, it needs to play a, a very important role in kind of talking about these issues. And of course, the big mega issue of all issues, climate. Um, and so you, if you got these issues around methane, um, which is to me a no brainer to fix some of these abandoned wells and, and you know, just deal with the point source directly. Um, climate's a major issue. And I think that's where you're seeing some of the groups will weigh in more on is the need to fix methane and climate issues, but they're not necessarily getting into the brass tacks of why there's these, you know, why one fifth of public lands, for example, are producing this amount of greenhouse gases. That's the work that I do. Um, and so it's kind of nice to work with folks like Sister Joan out of uh, New Mexico Interfaith Power and Light on these issues, um, where she works a lot with you know, methane regulation and kind of, you know, the actual production of methane coming directly out of, um, you know, the development of oil and gas. And I'm saying, you know, let's work on the point source around public lands, why some of these lands are being developed. And how do we deal with abandoned wells? How about uh, Deb Holland? Is, uh, is the early assessment uh, positive for her and her work? Yeah, I think so. Um, obviously, she put out a new plan called America the Beautiful, which is kind of its version of 30 by 30, which is to conserve 30% of America's lands and waters by 2030 in order to deal with the climate and wildlife um, crisis. And so, yeah, I think, you know, this is all in line with them. Um, you know, restoration and resilience is a big part of that America, the beautiful plan. Um, and so I think, you know, the, they're, you know, they, they had a mess to clean up. I mean, they, not just ecologically, but administratively and Department of Interior has been in shambles, BLM's, you know, got a lot of problems. So you're having to staff up, you're having to recover the mission of the agency, you're having to have the agency go from energy dominance is the only thing that matters to multiple use. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, um, my boss who's, you know, at the National Wildlife Federation is being considered to be um, the secretary uh, for BLM to run the director of BLM. Um, and she is, you know, she's, she's gonna need a mop in a bucket. And it's got, she's got a lot of work to do to fix what's going, what's happened in these agencies over the past couple years for sure. Um, and building up staff morale, staffing up the agency, making sure folks are in the right position and then enacting policy and procedure. Um, so yeah, I think Deb Holland's done a great job. I think she's got a lot of work cut out for her. And I think the agencies that fall within the Department of Interior, uh, you know, each one of those has a, a ton of work to figure out. Any other do, questions? Do more of these things actually get passed? than is in my imagination. It seems to me, once anything goes to the Senate, they say they're not gonna pass anything at all. But are, are more of these kinds of things um, being ena enacted than we, uh, that normally people uh, don't even really know that this is moving along? Yeah, I, I think yes and no. Um, the reason I say that is yes, in the sense that you're gonna see these kind. Of, I think like, you know, cleaning up abandoned wells. I mean, obviously bipartisan issue. You've got two Republicans, two Democrats on that Lujan Kramer bill already in the Senate, which is hard, right, to get them to agree to anything, much less work together. Um, so when you have that kind of optic, it looks really good for potential passage. The reality is, though, you're probably not going to hear about that bill passing. It's going to be part of a much larger package that comes with infrastructure and is going to be everything from roads and bridges to that. Um, and restoration and recovery issues around wildlife and other kinds of things, right? Um, so I think the reality is when there is some bipartisan bills, whether it's the royalty rates bill or it's the cleanup of abandoned wells bill, there's a lot of potential um, because it shows that you've got the votes basically to get it over the hump, at, you know, at minimum with a 51 vote with, you know, kind of reconciliation, which is a lot of how things get passed nowadays in the Senate, but potentially could even get past a filibuster vote. So that's obviously a good omen. Um, the challenge, of course, is, you know, you've got folks like Joe Manchin um, in West Virginia that, you know, he's going to want to, he's going to want things like abandoned mines cleanup. That's going to impact the state. He's going to want to have some of these other pieces, um, you know, around forest restoration, for example. So, you know, I think there's a lot of trade-offs to be had, and I think there's bigger package around infrastructure is being worked on um, and, you know, coming up in the, in the next couple of months. The, the reality is it's just going to be rolled into a, you know, massive package that's hundreds of pages long and most folks won't know about the specifics of that. They'll, they'll only catch the highlights. Um, but that's usually how things are moving right now is they tend to be in these bigger stimulus packages or infrastructure packages. Um, they don't move by themselves. 
And of course, there's a lot of trade-offs and there's some problems and good things about those bigger packages, as you all know. I mean, great example is in 2018, a lot of you saw the Trump tax bill. One of the things that most people have no idea was in that bill was the fact that they allowed drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. So one of the things that's going to be worked out on this next infrastructure bill is to remove those provisions to allow drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And that was in the tax bill, right? Um, so, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff going on like that that um, most most Americans just don't know about. And of course, folks are, have heard of ANWR or the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Um, I don't think most people know that they allowed for some lease sales up there for drilling in that tax bill. They have proved to not be very effective or uh, lucrative. And of course, that's a you know crown jewel of the United States in terms of wildlife and ecology and refuges. So um, I think that that's going to come up in this infrastructure package. It'll be controversial. You've got folks like Senator Murkowski out of Alaska who really want that to continue to move forward. And you're going to have other folks like Senator Cantwell and Senator um, you know, Collins out of Maine that are against it. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with something like that. And I'm also kind of working on those campaigns as well. Anyway, we'll, we'll go ahead and move on to the next area, which is our more local work. Um, and why, why do I want to talk to you all about the Caja del Rio? I suspect many of you went on the tour with me on the Caja del Rio and, that I led with First Press. I think we had probably close to 30, 40 people on that tour. Um, but why do I want to talk about you this right now? Because I think this is another area where you're going to see major efforts on protecting this area long term, um, which could mean something like we have a national monument in our own backyard here in Santa Fe. Um, Bill, you asked a question about Secretary Holland. We actually had her out on the ground to visit the Caja del Rio fortuitously um, last year. And uh, just, yeah, I think she was amazed by the area. And I think this area is, uh, uh, you know, you'll see, I think, in the presentation to come why it's really important to protect this area. So um, I wanted to kind of flag this for you all as kind of a sneak peek into what's happening um, right here in our own backyard and kind of some bigger issues to protect. I think you all can probably see my cursor. Um, here's the map of kind of the potential protected area. Green area is forest service land. The, um, the yellowish area is BLM land. Um, you're dealing with about 104,000 acres um, in this whole area. To get your bearings straight, this is kind of the Santa Fe airport area, La Cienega running into here. Here, of course, is Cochiti Pueblo, Cochiti Lake. This is the Dome Wilderness and kind of Bandelier area, Hemez Mountains, all heading through here. Up into this area is Tezuke Pueblo. And of course, you've got like Buckman um, and kind of that area up in, in the northern part along the running along the Rio Grande, of course. Um, so that'll help you get your bearings straight. This picture, of course, is from the La Siena Guia petroglyph site. Um, and you'll see, obviously, the petroglyph on the left, but you're overlooking, of course, La Cienega, and that would be down, of course, this area down here. Um, want to uh, kind of pivot and talk a little bit about why the Caja is so unique. And a lot of folks, I think, drive by it. They only see La Bajada. They feel like that area is just dry, desertous. Why would we even think about protecting that area? And I think from this presentation, I'm hoping, you know, from the visuals, you'll see exactly why. So the area is one of the most iconic landscapes um, and has profound cultural, historical, archaeological, and environmental significance. Um, you literally have scenic mesas, distinct valleys, and other unique geological features. The Caja del Rio obviously represents the key landscape, landscape demarcation between the Spanish, what the Spanish colonial world called the Rio Bajo and the Rio Riba. When the conquistadors came through this area, they noticed that there were distinct ecologies, economies, and cultures between southern New Mexico and northern New Mexico. I don't think that probably comes as a surprise to you all, um, but that was true 400 plus years ago. And so they called the area the Rio Riba, of course, Rio Riba County, where Española is, and the Rio Bajo, the lower river and the upper river. Um, the area has got really fascinating geology. You've got various fault zones along the Rio Grande Rift. If you look at this picture here, you're gonna see actually the big canyon on the left is actually the Santa Fe River Canyon. Uh, most of you think of the Santa Fe River as a little trickle that runs downtown, but if you think about how massive this river was historically to carve a canyon like that, we're talking about something very different. And then of course, on the left side of the picture, you see the Sandia Mountains. You're obviously formed by the Rio Grande Rift, which happened about two to five million years ago. Um, basalt is the predominant rock um, which, of course, is the black rock that makes the area ideal for petroglyphs um, or rock etchings, as you all know, um, and we'll kind of get more into that. But the area is actually one of the most ecologically rich habitats in North America. Um, and, and, you know, these pictures are all from the Caja. We've been out there working diligently over the last couple of years, taking lots of different photos, trying to capture 
and bring a visual representation to folks like you um, who, you know, have either been out there or haven't been out there, but, you know, kind of want to show you all what this area is really about. Um, it, the area has obviously distinct what they call cactus forests, um, everything from yucca to prickly pear to choya. Um, you're going to also see these green valleys and stuff like that, as you see on the right side, um, and, and much more lush pockets on the Caja. Um, you obviously have incredible blooming flowers. Um, and when the monsoons come, the area completely transforms and becomes a very green area um, where a lot of wildlife, of course, move into. Um, you've got a lot of wild flowers that are growing here. You, of course, you see, you know, everything from Scottish thistle to, you know, over the canyon to all kinds of native plants growing right there along the Caja del Rio and all these wildflowers. You're also gonna see big yucca forests and kind of choya forests kind of living side by side. If you look at this picture on the right, it kind of reminds me of something more like Maui um, with Haleakala and kind of the volcano there. Um, you're just gonna have very distinct landscapes with very kind of unique megafauna and biodiversity. Um, the area, of course, if you see it right here on the right side of the map, here's the area we're talking about. If you look at the area, I mean, just look at how many Pueblos are surrounding it. Um, you know, pretty much almost every one of the Rio Grande Pueblos, uh, at least within Northern New Mexico has a stake in this area. What's interesting is there's also um, connections, not only from uh, the area's Pueblos ranging from, of course, Cochiti to Nam Bay, um, and, but also Navajo um, uh, presence in the area, Apache presence in the area and Comanche presence in the area. Um, so they've actually found some interesting Comanche petroglyphs in the Santa Fe or in the Rio Grande River Canyon that we'll kind of look at um, that some of the archaeologists have found. So, you know, have a huge connection, of course, to the Pueblos rooted in the area. The one of the most iconic places, of course, is the La Cienaguilla set petroglyph site. This is one one mile away from city limits. Um, you've got most of the petroglyphs were done in the 13th to 17th century by the uh, Karasian speaking people. The people who speak Karas, obviously folks like Cochiti, Pueblo. Um, but a 1991 archaeological survey revealed that there were over 4,400 petroglyphs in just 1.5 kilometers. It's just one of the most densely populated petroglyph sites in the entire Southwest. Also one of the most densely populated sites in terms of birds and flute players. Um, and we'll kind of get into that. Um, I'm, I'm guessing many of you have been there. Some of you went on the tour with me there, but I would highly recommend it. Um, and I'd recommend going at times of the day where it's either cloudy or low level light early in the morning or later in the afternoon so that you can really see, um, you know, in terms of the glare of these petroglyphs. But as you see from this quote, um, you know, from Regina Weisskunk is, is we don't have our histories written in books. They're written on the walls of our canyons. This is a picture that I took of La Cienaguilla petroglyphs site a couple of weeks ago. Um, and what I want to do is let the petroglyph site actually tell the story of the Caja del Rio. So I wanted this to kind of be a fun and unique presentation in the sense of very visual for you all so that you can see um, the story of this area via the petroglyphs. Um, people have been on this landscape of the Caja del Rio for over 10,000 years. They were nomadic, um, which doesn't mean, of course, that they didn't know what direction they were going. It just means that they knew how to move with the wildlife or with the seasons. Um, and they inha they've inhabited this area for over 6,000 years. From 6,000 to 8,000 BCE, um, the area, they were mostly hunters following big game. Here you see different petroglyphs, obviously the spiral maybe indicating keeping of time, more cosmic celestial things. You see maybe what could be a shield right here on the right. Um, most of the folks that were in this area from 6,000 to 800 BCE were hunters um, following big games. They, of course, made their tools and their weapons out of the basalt rock that you're seeing many of these petroglyphs carved from. Here you see a picture of two um, that kind of indicate that, right? That you have this figure on the left, obviously a hunter with a bow and arrow, um, you know, showing kind of an ancient history of following the big game migrations through this area, hunting them. And of course, the bow and arrows came in around four, 400 to 700 um, in, in this modern era. And of course, then also came in with pottery. Then you, of course, see a spear here on the right and a, and a, and a very unique bird that um, I thought the artist was very crafty, making the hole in the rock the eye of the bird. So obviously, they knew what they were doing. Um, the area is also has really fascinating agriculture. If you all look at these petroglyphs, does anyone want to chime in and see what they see? Corn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You've got corn. Think about growing corn on this landscape. This, I mean, does this look like a landscape you would try to grow corn on? Um, this is not exactly Iowa, right? Um, 
the folks that were doing the agriculture were so sophisticated that they have what they call paleo agriculturists who have studied the people of this area and they have found that they're some of the most incredible least sophisticated agriculturalists that they found including you know going back to the Mayan and Incan Empire up on the top of the Caja some of you may have seen on a tour with me some of the catchment systems that they use and irrigation systems that they use to catch water and this was really occurring in the 13th century um, and so the other thing that occurred in, the, in that same time period was that this is the Santa Fe River Canyon on the right. There was a copper mine, an ancient copper mine that they were using to get metals out of that area uh, in the Santa Fe River Canyon. Um, so, you know, really sophisticated people who knew how to catch water, knew how to pool water on the top of this mesa. When you think about basalt, it's not very porous. And so obviously they had to figure out ways to use gravity and to catch water and to use water on top of the mesa as a way to irrigate their fields. The reason they're studying this so intensely is they think if they can understand a little bit better about how these folks lived in such an arid, um, complex ecosystem like this and actually were able to grow crops like corn, what does that offer to us modern people in terms of climate change and understanding how we can you know, better utilize the New Mexico landscape for everything from food production to um, dealing with more ecosystem resiliency. The other thing that you're going to find is a really interesting spirituality of the people. Um, here you see uh, what are known as cocapellis, right? The flute players, the iconic humpback flute player. Um, as many of you know, these flute players are often associated with fertility, joy, the spirit of music. They tend to, they could be jokesters, um, rain-making, storytelling. One of the things that I always think is really important to remind folks of petroglyphs is they're multivalent. We could say, well, we definitely see a flute player where we're like, you know, we see that, you know, figure with a bow and arrow, but it could also be much more spiritual and symbolic than that, right? That these are, these Petroglyphs have many meanings, and just because we in a modern context want to assign a meaning doesn't necessarily mean that that meaning is true or was true to the people, of course, of that time. But what's interesting that I never knew is, does anyone know what the humpback um, could be symbolic of, of on the flute player? Some kind of arthritis? <laughs> yeah. Could be. Um, what most folks say is that it's actually a pack of seeds that the flute player brings in the warm winds of the spring, carrying a pack of seeds to talk about when it's best to plant. Of course, changing from the winter season to the spring season, carrying the seeds with them, obviously indicative of fertility, not only in the human sense, but also in the sense of the landscape itself. So hence why the humpback is there. The other thing you're gonna see are interesting markings like these. These are intense. Um, the one on the right is, is very intense to me. Um, these could be kachinas. Um, visitors from another spirit world. These could be clan markings to say this is where a certain family lives. Um, these could be ancestral spirits. Um, what's interesting is the one in the center, um, you see this kind of one antler to one antler up, one antler down, depending on how you're looking at that petroglyph in the center. That exact same petroglyph is in bandolier. So, uh, you know, I talked to folks and they were saying that could be a, a vision of a spirit world, that could be a clan marking. Um, and interestingly, I took some youth from Santa Domingo and they were talking about how in one of their uh, uh, feast day dances, they have a figure that kind of looks like that. So, um, you know, like I said, we don't necessarily assign meaning to these, but I think you have some very intense kind of spiritual figures that could also be marking the heads of families, could also just be um, what a medicine man may have seen in the visit to the spirit world. And you're going to see all these, of course, at La Siena Guia. The other thing that you're gonna see is the incredible connection of the land, water, and wildlife, of course, to the spirituality and to the petroglyphs. Um, you're gonna see huge thunderbird markings and the area has one of the greatest densities of birds, on, you know, in terms of actual real birds, but also in terms of petroglyphs. The area in modern days has also been designated as an important bird area. Uh, you're gonna see everything from hawks, which is red tails and sharp shinned hawks, moving in the area to golden eagles, to of course, burrowing owls. Um, you know, burrowing owls are, are there in that area. They're, they're mating in that area. You see here one on the left. These are all actual pictures we took on the Caja del Rio, which is kind of cool to be able to match these up with the petroglyphs from, you know, this picture on the right is really interesting. It's a picture I took, you know, I'm not a huge birder. Um, I wish folks, some folks maybe on this are. To me, I thought it was a giant red tailed hawk, but it also could be a, maybe a golden eagle. Um, so not really sure. It, so there you go, some Cooper's Hawk in the picture. There you go, Mar Margaret Dean weighing in. Hey, Margaret, if you have a sense of what that bigger picture is on the right, I, it was massive. I mean, the wingspan of this thing was, was had to be five feet. Um, all I know is I, I got to see it. It was about to take off and fly, and I wasn't sure if it was a red 
hawk or, or maybe a golden eagle, but but obviously they're yeah. not. Yeah, you know, I think it. I think it certainly is an eagle. It's that I'm looking, seeing a big, really big beak on it. But whether it's a golden or an immature bald eagle, which would not have the white head yet, I can't tell from that picture. Right. Well, perfect, Margaret. Margaret, thank you. I, I, I'm you'd be on this morning because I know you're big into birds, and so obviously the Kaha's got some incredible ones. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I wasn't sure. I, all I know is it was massive and I was watching it take flight. I mean, it was one of the biggest birds I've seen in person. Um, so obviously the Kaha has got a lot of prey for these birds to hunt um, at those kind of raptors. Um, let's go here. Obviously you have a lot of other birds in the area, incredible bird life going on in the area. And then the petroglyphs are going to indicate that. Um, you have a wide variety of birds in the area, everything from orioles, of course, to threshers, um, to burrowing owls, and of course, you see some of the unique birds that are on the Kaha. One of the things that they found is a lot of the birds that are on the Kaha, one of the things that makes them super distinct is the fact that these birds um, are only found much farther south. Um, and so it has kind of a very unique ecosystem to be at this level of elevation this far north, but a lot of the birds that you find on the Kaha actually only are found in, in habitats that are much farther south. Of course, you have roadrunners. Um, I thought that was a pretty accurate depiction on the petroglyph on the right compared to the roadrunner you see here on the left. Um, then you've got a lot of reptiles and amphibians. Um, I was really impressed by the art done and the accuracy done on the snake on the left. Of course, you see the tongue uh, coming out and potentially the rattle right there um, on the bottom of the tail of this snake. And of course, you have a figure maybe saying warning there's snakes in the area or maybe this person got bit or maybe that person just has nothing to do with that snake at all. Um, Obviously, big rattler here on the Caja del Rio. We've seen a lot of them in the La Siena Guia petroglyph site. That's also why I recommend going when it's a little bit cooler, lower level light. Um, the rattlers will tend to come out in the day, and I've been on a couple of tours where I've taken some folks out, and I've seen two or three rattlers actually in the area. Um, there's something you obviously don't want to mess with. Um, the other thing that you're going to find there are things like horny toads and collared lizards. I've grown up in Santa Fe. I've never seen a collared, common collared lizard in my entire life. There it is on the right side at La Siena uh, St. Sienegia petroglyph site. It was one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen. It looked like a you know mix of a gecko and an iguana. Um, so incredible wildlife. I don't know if any of you have ever seen one of those, but they're pretty pretty unique and interesting. And it was pretty good size. It was probably a total of eight, nine inches in length. The other thing is that you're going to find that the area has huge, uh, has been a big game migration area from Colorado to Mexico. It's kind of a linchpin between, of course, Bandelier National Monument, Jemez, Sangria, Sangria de Cristo, Sandia Mountains. You're going to have a lot of mule deer, you're going to have elk, you, yeah, one time you had pronghorn antelope in those areas, and of course you have the petroglyphs indicating all of that. Here you see a mule deer pictured on the left um, that was taken on the Caja del Rio. You see another mule deer here on the left, and of course you see the petroglyphs kind of indicating with the antlers right here, um, you know, the presence of big game migration, and of course a lot of the folks were using these um, column, kind of following the big game. Here you're going to see uh, obviously a, a a baby um, nested down in the grass, obviously scentless, being you know being left kind of by their mother while their mother goes out and forages. And of course, you see the petroglyphs kind of indicating such things here on the right. The other thing it's going to speak of is the apex predators that are in the area. You of course have black bear, cougar, badgers. Um, you also have um, you know coyote. Um, potentially, you had wolves obviously in this area. I don't think potentially you probably did have wolves in this area, and that could be what you see on the left of the petroglyph. You also may see like a nautilus shell, obviously indicating that this area may be more riparian. Of course, you find a lot more of those areas in places like Ghost Ranch that were underwater historically. Fish, one of the most unique petroglyphs. Of course, my favorite as a fly fisherman is this uh, uh, fish that you see on the on the rock, indicating the water of the area. Here you see the Rio Grande River Canyon um, and kind of pictured and how riparian this area was. And of course, you have things like the Rio Grande Cutthroat Trout, historically that were probably in this area. Not so much anymore because the water now is too warm and has been dammed in various places um, and also, also obviously diverted. Here's actually a petroglyph scene that you'll see in the Santa Fe River Canyon. Look at the density of the petroglyphs, the different wildlife on there. You've got the human hand, the, the uh, ungulates of deer and elk and stuff like that. And then of course you have these riparian areas down in the Santa Fe River Canyon on the right. The other thing you're gonna see is of course the Spanish petroglyphs. You see the church cross right there, of course with the horny toad. Um, right above it. And so you're going to have Spanish petroglyphs coinciding, of course, you know, indicating the arrival of Oñate and the conquistadors in 1598, um, bringing in obviously their own customs, cultures, and practices, as well as religion coming in, obviously Catholic, Roman, you know, Catholic uh, perspectives. You're going to see a church here as a petroglyph, and you're obviously going to see kind of a, almost a tabernacle scene with the bird holding the cross. Obviously, the bird life still being very indicative 
of the area, uh, even to the Spanish as they arrived in on the Camino Real. That's the other thing that you're going to find in the area is the Camino Real. Um, of course, running from Mexico City up to San Juan Pueblo or Okeo Wingue. You, of course, had, you know, folks like Oñate coming in, marking this area. They established the capitals of San Juan, which was Okeo Wingue and, of course, Santa Fe. Um, and then, of course, the Pueblo Revolt occurs. Um, Twelve years later, de Vargas comes back in and resettles this area for the Spanish. Um, you've got a significant portion, obviously, up in here of the Camino Real and one of the most iconic historic proportions of the Camino Real. Here you see the actual Camino Real. You can see the road kind of moving through here and it goes up and through 26 hairpin turns. This is where they were bringing in mules and carts. It took about six months to get from Mexico City to Santa Fe. Um, and obviously there's still wagon swallows and stuff like that, uh, wheels in, in, the, in the dirt that you can see archeologically. Um, and this is kind of right off the edge of La Bajada. Right here is the view. And of course you get to see the actual Camino Real coming up. Then of course that road becomes New Mexico Highway 1. Um, and then later becomes, of course, Route 66. Here's the, uh, the edge that we were looking over that you can see the road still kind of coming up on. There you see Mayor Weber and his wife took them out on a tour a couple of weeks ago. Um, the area became Route 66, obviously, in, in the mid-1900s. Um, in 1912, it was New Mexico Highway 1. In 1926, it became Route 66. Um, you had 23 hairpin turns. Um, the Model Ts in those days had to go up this road backwards because there was no fuel injection and they needed to keep the fuel in the engine. So that's the last kind of piece that I wanted to talk about. Um, the last piece to cover is, of course, there's a lot of problems out on the car, a lot of challenges. You've got a lot of road development. Lano wants to develop a four-lane highway that basically cuts Santa Fe out of the equation and, of course, the Rio Grande Valley or Española Valley. Um, and go straight into White Rock. Um, the other area is you, of course, have theft of petroglyph sites. If you'll notice here, this petroglyph was shot, a Cocapelli family was shot by a paintball. They had to scrub it, and of course, that's why that one's distorted. You see a paintball shot right here next to this petroglyph right there. Um, you got illegal dumping, unregulated shooting. That means without a backstop or poaching. Uh, a lot of that's occurring. They shot uh, one of the pairs of burrowing owls a couple of years back. Um, so there's a lot of challenges and problems and why this area needs to be protected long term, in, in addition to, of course, fires and threat of climate change. So all of those kind of pieces are going here. You see the tour of first press. Uh, some of you were on that um, great picture as we're at the very edge of the escarpment um, overlooking the Camino Real right there on the edge. And of course, Coach E being off to the right and San Diego's on to the left. And why do I want to protect this area? Obviously, being native from this area, you see my nephew on the left. And of course, Brooke and I in a pack hiking in the Petrico site this winter. It's a little cold. She sees, seems a little, little chilly. Um, but, but I think it's obviously important to protect for future generations, given how cultural rich this area is. And then that's it. So I wanted to escape out of this and uh, see if we can stop the screen share. I don't know how to, how to do that, but um, there we go. So yeah, there you go. Want to be mindful of everybody's time. Uh, obviously, it covered a lot of ground on what's happening locally and federally. Um, but it's kind of cool to tell you all the story of a lot, you know, this area through the petroglyphs. I'm happy to answer any questions, and I know folks gotta gotta wrap up here. I'm glad it was recorded. <clears throat> Maybe an, another meeting can use it. That was great. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it was kind of fun to put together all the pictures of the wildlife that we. Uh, Took pictures of and then of course put those next to the actual pitch post. So we always get to do that. But you no know, folks got to head to the next meeting. Uh, just it, one one take one minute. Anybody have any last questions or anything else? Thank you very much. Yeah. Bob Barnes, I see you on there. I need to hit you up for doing some fishing in the Pecos. <laughs> just a flag that for you. But uh, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to spend some time this morning and I hope it was helpful and I'm happy to answer any questions if you want to me on either the federal side of things and where that's going as much as I can tell you that and then of course, you know help with anything on the call for real. Let's do the Pecos. Okay I'll, I'll contact you Bob get get the family up there and do some <laughs> All right thank you all. <laughs>